Right. Uh, seen a fair number of people in the Zoom chat and in our participant list, so I think we can make a start. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to our eighth online workshop. Uh, today, we'll be talking about, uh, for the first time, uh, eye abnormalities in Allport syndrome. Today, we have two presenters from Australia, hence the weird time, who are going to talk about eye, uh, eye abnormalities in our disease. These don't usually affect vision, but they use them in their clinic to identify people who are likely to have Allport syndrome. The changes in retina usually need a photograph for their detection. OCT is also helpful, and they have used the corneal changes as a model for what happens in the kidney. Let's start with some introductions. Our speakers today are Judy Colville, Professor of Medicine at the University of Melbourne, and Deb Colville, Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Melbourne. She's in, uh, Judy is a nephrologist, a researcher, and chairs the genetics mutations group that works out the prognosis of complicated mutations, um, as well as being interested in eyes. So we're very, very lucky to have uh, her and Deb here today. Um, they'll both be talking about eye abnormalities in Allport syndrome. Furthermore, we're very privileged to have our scientific moderator who will be helping to put uh, the scientific questions to the guests. Today, that's Omar Maru, a consultant of, uh, ophthalmologist at St. Thomas's Hospital and Moorfields Eye Hospital. Right, I think that's just about enough from me. I think it's about time I hand over to Judy. Would you mind sharing your screen and taking us away? Mm. Okay, right. can everyone see that now? Looks like we can see it. Um, Great. Yeah, go ahead, one ready. Lovely. Okay, thank you. So, thank you for the invitation to Allport UK um, to speak on the eye abnormalities in Allport syndrome. I'm an adult nephrologist or a kidney doctor, and um, I've been collaborating with Deb Colville for more than 20 years, and she's an ophthalmologist with a special interest in paediatrics. Um, I've put my eye, uh, my email address there if people have any questions and want to contact me afterwards. So this is a photo of Deb, but I think you all can see her anyway. And I'd just like to start off by acknowledging our patients. And we've also been helped in this work by many medical students and orthoptists, um, ortho ophthalmologists and kidney doctor colleagues. We've had many other collaborators too from across the world. And the talk that I'm going to give is focusing on what patients may like to know, but I'm also going to talk about some technical things for the kidney doctors and also for the eye doctors and optometrists who may uh, be helping to examine your eyes um, in the future. So Allport syndrome, I think that people who've been following these webinars will know a little bit about the background, that it affects mainly basement membranes and there's six type 4 collagen chains found in the body and three of those combine to form a special molecule, the collagen 4, alpha 3, 4 and 5 molecule which is those, those three chains combined and this forms the backbone of specialised basement membranes in the kidney, the ear and the eye. And when you have a mutation in one of those genes um, then you'll get an abnormal membrane and that will affect the function of the kidney, ear and eye. So just to remind you, the basement membranes are anchored onto um, a specialised cell in the glomerular filter called uh, the podocyte. And uh, the abnormal membranes, this is a normal basement membrane here, this um, curved structure, um, they may be abnormally thinned or they may be very irregular um, and thickened um, with holes in them. And that's a pretty typical picture of what the basement membrane looks like in Allport syndrome. So the membranes that occur in the eye that are affected are the corneal membranes, the lens membrane, and the retina membrane. I'll just go through the uh, genetics of Allport syndrome again, because the eye features are slightly different in each different kind of inheritance. And so when we see some features, knowing your gender, we're able to then think, well, this is probably an example of X-linked Allport syndrome or autosomal recessive Allport syndrome. So X-linked disease accounts for about 85% of all the families with Allport syndrome. And the 
gene that's affected is the Coltray 5 gene, and that corresponds to the alpha, chain, alpha 5 chain of type 4 collagen. People with X-linked Allport syndrome only have one mutation, whether they're uh, male or female. But the males have worse disease because they normally only have one X chromosome and one Colfrey 5 gene. So they're more likely to get kidney failure and hearing loss, abnormal lens, um, and also some fleck retinopathy in the center and the periphery of the retina. In contrast, women um, are, have milder features, but they're affected twice as often. So in a family, there'll be twice as many women as there are men affected. And the women have hematuria and a hearing loss and tend to just have a peripheral fleck retinopathy if they have anything at all. There's also some um, unusual things about the inheritance. Uh, a male with X-linked disease will either have a new mutation or he will have inherited that mutation from his mother only, not from his father. Whereas a female could have inherited the uh, mutant gene from either her father or her mother. Autosomal recessive Allport syndrome is about 15% of Allport syndrome families. And the mutations can be in either the Colfrey 3 or the Colfrey 4 gene, corresponding to the alpha 3 or the alpha 4 chain of type 4 collagen. And people with recessive disease will have two mutations but in only one of these genes. So they'll have two mutations in the Colfrey 3 gene or two mutations in the Colfrey 4 gene. And males and females will have inherited the affected equally often, but they will have inherited um, one mutation from both of their parents. So one mutation from their mother and one mutation from their father. And they get kidney failure and hearing loss. And they get lenticonus and a central and peripheral fleck retinopathy. And the final kind of Allport syndrome, it's a bit controversial what its name is, but I'll probably call it autosomal dominant Allport syndrome. This actually is much, much more common than the other kinds. And uh, it's, the it's actually the carrier state of autosomal recessive Allport syndrome, and it affects about 1% of the whole population. And people have just one mutation in either the Colfrey 3 or Colfrey 4 gene, and that will affect either the alpha 3 or the alpha 4 chain, but they tend to have very mild disease. Males and females will be affected equally often, and they will have inherited the mutation from either their mother or their father. And most people just have hematuria, and a small proportion develop kidney failure, but they usually don't have a hearing loss, and they don't have any eye abnormalities. So I just wanted to start off with some really important things for you to take away from the meeting. And Patrick's referred to these already. Most eye abnormalities in Allport syndrome don't affect your eyesight. And if they do, they're treatable. So the eye changes are more severe in men with X-linked Allport syndrome and in people with recessive Allport syndrome than in women with X-linked disease. But women with X-linked disease are very common. And there's no eye abnormalities in autosomal dominant Allport syndrome. Now, I'm an adult kidney doctor, so I don't see children, but my impression is that the eye abnormalities are less common in children. Um, they may be there in a very early form and then gradually get worse. I think they probably, um, there have been reports occurring in very young children, but um, if anything, they usually occur in teenage years. So if we're trying to work out if somebody has Allport syndrome, uh, sometimes it isn't such a good idea to examine the child's eyes. Well, you should examine the child's eyes, but what's going to be more informative is if the doctor examines the eyes of the mother with, for example, a boy with suspected X-linked Allport syndrome. So that mother, in most cases, will be um, will also have X-linked Allport syndrome, and she may very well have a peripheral retinopathy. So eye changes, I think, usually first appear in teenagers, and they gradually worsen over time, um, so that uh, the fleck retinopathy um, is usually, uh, if it's going to occur, is pretty florid by the 20s, and the lenticonus um, is present by uh, the 30s. 
So as far as patients are concerned, what are the symptoms of the eye abnormalities in Allport syndrome? Well, if we look at them divided up to, to the three basement membranes that are affected, the corneal basement membrane, the condition that occurs most often is recurrent corneal erosions. And people complain of repeated episodes lasting um, a few days to um, a week or so. So they'll have repeated episodes of gritty red eyes on waking up um, or walking outside, in, especially in windy conditions, or after too much screen time. This diagnosis is often missed though, and we've seen patients who have it and who've been given another explanation for it uh, by their ophthalmologists and not uh, connected with the diagnosis of Allport syndrome. We don't know how common this is. Um, some studies have said that it's very common, perhaps 20% of all affected people, but uh, these features are transient. Um, often we don't ask our patients about them, so we don't know how often they occur. Posterior polymorphous corneal dystrophy is another eye manifestation that affects the cornea. Um, and it's very classical when it occurs in Allport syndrome, but uh, I have never seen, seen it and Deb has never seen it either. We have been sent some photographs of people who have it though. Um, so it, it uh, does occur in Allport syndrome. Now, abnormalities of the lens, patients will complain of difficulty in focusing. And Deb says they might um, go to their um, ophthalmologist or optometrist and get a new pair of glasses. And then a year later, they need another new pair of glasses that are a bit stronger. Um, so under these circumstances, you'd be thinking about uh, maybe lenticonus um, in a patient with Allport syndrome. And this can be treated with lens replacement, which is the same operation as happens with uh, cataract surgery. And uh, lenticonus occurs in probably about 30% of men with X-linked Allport syndrome. The commonest changes that we see are a fleck retinopathy. Um, this doesn't have any symptoms of it all. The patient won't know that they have it and it doesn't affect the eyesight at all but it's a useful clue to the diagnosis. It's very common and it occurs in up to 50% of patients with X-linked disease or recessive disease. And it also is common in women with X-linked disease. Another uh, abnormality that affects the retina is a giant macular hole or a maculopathy. And what happens here is that the central part of the retina is affected and the patient finds it or can't read a book, um, but they can see all right at the sides um, or in the periphery. This is rare. Um, uh, each of these conditions is rare. So I'll just go through some of the um, appearances of these conditions. Uh, recurrent corneal erosions. Um, uh, we haven't been able to get a photograph of it, but these are some photographs um, using a slit lamp of the posterior polymorphous corneal dystrophy. So as I said before, um, the recurrent corneal erosions are often uncommon or overlooked. Um, and they're usually the patient has um, a few symptoms and they can be treated with um, uh, some lubricants. And also if the patient knows what brings on these episodes, they can try to avoid them. We have done some studies um, of the cornea though in patients with um, Allport syndrome, and we we're able to show that the corneal cells, uh, even in people who don't have uh, clinical features associated with the cornea, the corneal cells drop off the basement membrane in the eye. And you can see here, these are the control cells. They're really rather regular um, and all approximately the same size. And here, the cells are very variable in size. So these are from a male and a female with X-linked Allport syndrome. So it's a subtle abnormality, uh, but it, we believe it's the same phenomenon as happens in the kidney where you lose podocytes over the abnormal basement membrane. This is the abnormality of the lens. Um, there's a, a, a dimple in the front of the um, eye. So what we're looking at here is shining a light into the pupil. And you know how sometimes, especially with children, you get a, a red eye. This is uh, looking through 
that um, uh, red eye. And so this is sometimes called an oil droplet because it moves as the patient's eye moves too. So this is a reasonably common manifestation occurring uh, in about 30% of men with X-linked Allport syndrome. Um, it's all very common in recessive disease. And this is the problem that's associated with the difficulty in focusing. And why this occurs is that the base membrane of the lens is um, uh, damaged and uh, the lens actually protrudes uh, out the front of the eye and you get this uh, little dimple. And this is treated, as I said, with lens replacement like for cataract surgery. Sometimes that uh, lenticonus is also associated with a cataract. This is the central fleck retinopathy. And what you can see here, people who aren't orientated, this is the, uh, the retina, back of the eye. So we're looking through the pupil. These are the blood vessels, and this is the optic nerve. So this is the nerve that takes everything you see to the back of the, eye, uh, to the, back of the brain. This is uh, what the part of the eye that you use to read with, it's central vision. If you look at someone and they look at you, um, then this part of your eye is looking at, uh, at that part of the eye on the other person. Your fovea is looking at their fovea. So um, what you see here is that this uh, part of the retina looks absolutely normal, but around the retina you have lots and lots of little white dots. And these actually tend to move out a little bit too. And this is the central fleck retinopathy. Sometimes there is... Um, an appearance like this, which is a lozenge. And what you have is, uh, looks like normal retina at the center. But if you look closely, and if you magnify this up, you'll see that there's actually a lot of little white dots surrounding that um, central part of the retina. And this is actually a florid example of a retinopathy. So um, it's important that ophthalmologists realise that this is not a normal variant, but it's actually um, a very uh, severe case of a retinopathy. And this corresponds, if you do optical coherence tomography, to uh, some thinning of the retina. Um, and uh, you can see that this lozenge uh, appearance uh, corresponds here to the thinning. So it's possible to actually measure the amount of thinning that somebody has in the retina. And this is characteristically uh, abnormal in people with Allport syndrome. So we've studied a lot of people with Allport syndrome using the amount of thinning. And you can see here, um, these are people with uh, other kinds of kidney disease, and that's the amount of thinning, which is, might be 7%, whereas with uh, men with X-linked Allport syndrome, the average amount of thinning was about 12%. And similarly, people with autosomal recessive Allport syndrome, about 12%. But women with X-linked Allport syndrome um, had uh, about 7%, which was the normal amount of thinning. And the carriers with um, autosomal dominant Allport syndrome also had just a normal amount of thinning. So this is a very useful test. Um, because it involves uh, uh, a non-invasive uh, series of photographs of the eye using optical coherence tomography. Optical coherence tomography is like ultrasound, but it shines uh, a light into the eye and looks at the reflection from the retina and the different layers of the retina. And I'll have some more photographs in a minute. Now, I said that this talk was also for ophthalmologists, because I've put in here the um, how to calculate the amount of thinning and uh, uh, produce this temporal thinning index. And uh, when you get the slides, you'll be able to see that it's actually quite uh, an easy uh, formula that you take the amount of thinning um, on here, which is the temporal side, um, uh, from the nasal side, and divide it by the nasal sides to get the uh, percentage reduction. Uh, the thinning may be so severe that there's actually some loss of the retina and you get a retinal hole. This person here has two retinal holes. You can see it on the uh, looking through cross-section of the um, uh, retina. 
here uh, showing the depression. So there's been some loss of the retina and here there's two holes and these holes can join up and you can get what's called a giant macular hole. This is very difficult to deal with surgically um, and uh, it may be associated with loss of what we said is central vision, uh, which you use for when you look at somebody else, when you read a book, etc. So that's rare though, uh, would occur in fewer than 3% um, of patients and it doesn't necessarily occur in both eyes at the same time. So um, that central retinopathy uh, can be missed and we've used a few tricks to make sure that we don't miss it. So here's a picture of um, uh, a retina and it doesn't look that abnormal to a renal physician. But if you actually take a, a black and white view, or um, technically it would be a red free um, view, you can see that retinopathy much more easily. This is demonstrating another rare complication that occurs in the retina of Allport syndrome, and this is an Allport maculopathy. And um, you can see here there's a lot of pigment and there's also some areas of depigmentation and on the OCT scan, there's also some abnormalities here. And this shows the progression over a period of about 20 years. This is the peripheral retinopathy, and we find that this is very useful um, diagnostically, especially in um, the mother of that uh, boy who came in with suspected Allport syndrome. So um, these are coalescing. Uh, flex in the periphery. You can see it's the periphery because you couldn't see that white dot, the optic nerve here. So um, lots of little white dots um, can be a bit fluffier than this. And here, this is a, um, a photograph that's taken actually in a shopping centre in a, um, a shop selling uh, spectacles. And what you can see here, there's the optic nerve again. Here are the blood vessels. And here are uh, um, is the peripheral retinopathy, which is quite easy to see. So I mentioned before that the eye features can help with the diagnosis of Allport syndrome, and I've made a table just showing some of the um, these characteristic features. And of all of these features, lenticonus and the central retinopathy are very characteristic of Allport syndrome. And if you see them, then the person has Allport syndrome. The peripheral retinopathy is a little bit harder to visualize and you do need to take um, peripheral photographs, so it's not the standard photographs. Um, and temporal thinning requires OCT for its measurement. But um, all of these features are characteristic of Allport syndrome. Um, and the peripheral retinopathy is useful because it occurs in females with X-linked Allport syndrome too. Um, as well as in people with autosomal recessive Allport syndrome. And the temporal thinning uh, is also uh, pretty common in men with X-linked Allport syndrome um, and in women, uh, people, men and women with recessive disease. So the eye abnormalities uh, can be used to help make the diagnosis of Allport syndrome, but not only that, um, they can also indicate that this is more severe disease than um, uh, if they don't occur. If any of these features occur, then the patient should undergo genetic testing to confirm the diagnosis of Allport syndrome. So these eye abnormalities um, all suggest the diagnosis of Allport syndrome. They're more common with more severe disease. For the kidney doctor, what tests should you do? The lenticonus is visible just with ophthalmoscopy. And then it's good if the kidney doctor can order retinal photographs using a non-midriatic retinal camera. So this is the kind of camera that is used uh, for monitoring diabetic retinopathy. And no dilating drops are needed to use this camera and get the photographs. And then uh, you'll need central views, which are centered on the um, fovea or macula, and peripheral views, which are more than two disc diameters from the fovea. And you may need to do some black and white or red free manipulation to be able to see the retinopathy clearly. Optical coherence tomography is useful to detect the, that temporal retinal thinning, but you do need dilating drops for that. 
and then you can use the formula to detect uh, whether the thinning is abnormal. For an ophthalmologist, they'll perform a slit lamp examination. Uh, we've sent our patients to a corneal expert for corneal specular microscopy. And an ophthalmologist will also take the retinal photographs and do OCT. So the take home messages for the patients are, you should know the type of Allport syndrome in your family, whether it's, it's X-linked or autosomal recessive, and it's good to know your mutation. So keep your genetics report with you for clinic visits, especially when you're going to see a new doctor. So it's good to see an eye doctor who's interested in your condition and the kinds of abnormalities that you may get. And you can take a copy of this talk with you to show the photographs. And it's good to have a thorough eye examination together with retinal photographs and peripheral views and OCT at least once as an adult. And you should tell your eye doctors immediately about any change in vision that you have. What I haven't mentioned is some of the changes that can occur after a kidney transplant. Cataracts are quite common after a kidney transplant after a number of years and they're treated with lens replacement. Um, if you've already had a lens replacement for lenticonus, you won't need another one. And eye infections may also be more common after a transplant. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Judy, for, for, for managing to, to pitch your presentation to both uh, patients and researchers so well. Um, I actually wanna go straight to um, Deb in this case, if that's okay, um, because Deb, this this primer that we talked about that that final part of of Judy's talk, um, you mentioned in the rehearsal yesterday that uh, or on Monday that it would be good perhaps to bring this primer of symptoms to your ophthalmologist, bearing in mind that this these these people may not have encountered the condition before, um, at least in their training. Uh, yeah, um, and. And and for Judy as well, I'm 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 so sorry for calling you Judy Colville in the introduction. By the way, I'm so, it's so early. <laughs> I I uh, I'm a young person. It's it's the middle of the night for me as well. Um, I I was interested by your 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 list of the symptoms there. Um, what sort of stage do we start to see these abnormalities? Because in the renal function, we see a a, a degradation in kidney function over the course of a person's life. Is it similar with eyes? Are we likely to see it at a certain age? Yes, I mean, I think that the, uh, we're using pretty crude measurements, but the fleck retinopathy, um, uh, the youngest I've seen it is in a 14 year old. I think Deb has seen these changes in a child under the age of 10, but the fleck retinopathy gradually gets worse and worse, or uh, it gets worse and worse, more pronounced, but in fact, it doesn't affect vision. Mm -hmm. um, I think even when very specialised tests have been done of vision, they're not abnormal. Mm -hmm. um, so I can just add to that, Patrick. Yeah, go for it. So I've just seen recently a Melbourne four-year-old with definite retinopathy and I think early lenticonus. So that's the youngest I've seen, that child. But I would agree with Judy, it would be very rare, I think, certainly under 12, but it's certainly worth looking for particularly in a child, in a, in a boy, in a new family, for example, where you're wanting, you're wanting to make the definite diagnosis and it gives you a clue to the inheritance. And often mm. their mother is very willing and often has the peripheral retinopathy to, to confirm the diagnosis. So you can make the diagnosis of the alpha even before the genetic test. Mm. Um, uh, Francis has asked a very pertinent question, which is how early would you recommend um, screening all port patients and, and, and a, a sort of follow-up to that should all port patients get proactively um screen for these eye abnormalities um without perhaps experiencing any symptoms that's to, to judy or deb whichever wants one of you wants to join in look i actually think it's worthwhile mm -hmm. um and i i mean we take retinal photographs of all of our patients who come through the genetics renal genetics clinic um, and the reason I say I think it's worthwhile is we've seen several people who have macular holes and um, they've often been told, don't worry about it. Um, well, not that often. We've only seen three of them. 
but um, one of them in particular was told, don't worry about it. Um, and I think it had probably been misdiagnosed. Um, and these can progress. And I think um, it's just worthwhile knowing about um, any changes there. And the lens abnormalities too. Uh, I mean, it may be that you're more likely to pick up a, a cataract in a post-transplant patient. But I think, I, I think it's worthwhile. Is there a reason that cataracts are common in post-transplant patients? Related to steroid treatment. Okay. Uh, yeah. okay. So nowadays, nowadays the doses of steroids are much lower and sometimes some regimens don't even use steroids after the first um, period of time. Mm -hmm. um, we had a question about screen time from a patient. And is there any way to mitigate the impacts? You mentioned avoiding um, triggers to these uh, corneal erosions. Um, is, is there any way to question. mitigate it? Go on. I'm going to hand that question over to um, the ophthalmologist. <laughs> speaking as a mother, I don't mind limiting screen time at all. Mm -hmm. um, Deb, if you might uh, just speak a little bit closer to your microphone, because I, I, uh, I notice when you're not very loud and we've got a lot of patients with hearing difficulties on the call. <laughs> um, so this, this issue of screen time, what, what are your thoughts on maybe limiting it or perhaps limiting the effect that it has on these corneal erosions? think it would make any difference. I'm sorry, Judy. <laughs> what do you think, Mark? I, it's the, the, and, and it's, not, it's not that common. It's more that, um, in my experience, it's not that common. I've seen a lot of people with outports and I always ask them and, it, and it's not my experience that most of them have it. Um, but the important thing is if they do have some corneal signs for the ophthalmologist to make the link with the outport. So then you know it's likely to persist. Whereas we've been had we've had Australian patients who were told they just had a virus, and actually in retrospect that was when the, they presented to the ophthalmologist. So I think a lot of it is about the patient knowing their own body, and being able to explain their own symptoms. And just to go back to the lenticonus, sure. some patients do have quite distorted vision with the lenticonus, and it is really quite useful for them to know that it is going to get worse, but that it is curable with lens extraction. So we've had a number of Australian patients who've been very puzzled and so have their ophthalmologists about the progression of their blurred vision. Um, but as soon as the, the ophthalmologist makes the connection, then the patients do get better treatment. Mm -hmm. um, we've got someone in the chat um, asking if the UK does this proactively. Um, perhaps not when, when you were getting diagnosed, but um, please do visit the link up in the chat somewhere. Um, and, and talk to St. Thomas as if you're having symptoms. I've got a final question, and I'm not sure if it's dumb or not, but I'm going to ask it anyway, um, which has really been the story of these workshops. Uh, we, uh, as kidney patients, someone has uh, said that they have had to go on a, on, on a diet, which I'm sure, Judy, you know a lot about. Um, is there any impact of diet on these symptoms in the eye? Um, I would say no, <laughs> uh, but I can say also that um, we do see some patients who have end-stage renal failure from any cause and have very disturbed calcium and phosphate metabolism, and they can get deposits in the eye. Now, I haven't seen them for a long time because I think we have much, much better medication now. But when I started out in my career, we'd often see people with um, a conjunctivitis and uh, uh, deposits of uh, calcium in their eye. All right. Well, uh, thank you both. Um, I'm going to hand over to Omar now, who I'm sure has got um, a few questions of his own. Um, do keep popping questions in the chat, everyone, um, if you have anything you want to ask. Great. Thank, thanks, Patrick. And thanks, uh, Judy, for a, a great talk. Um, just before going on, I just want to, to sort of emphasize that exactly as you said, um, the eye problems in Alport syndrome tend not to affect the vision, so people shouldn't get stressed about them. And the few that do affect the vision, we can normally treat quite effectively. So I, I'd say people shouldn't get stressed about having to see an eye doctor and, unless they have some symptoms. So it's worth checking your vision regularly, each eye separately. And if you have 
got the problem with your vision, then, then do try and see an optometrist or an eye doctor, an ophthalmologist. Um, but if you don't, then don't feel stressed that oh, so you're going to really miss out on something. Uh, th there's another reason to see your eyes in that it might help the kidney doctors. So not because it'll help your eyes or your vision, because your vision might be fine. But as you say, we might see a few things that would help the, the kidney doctors or the geneticists rather than something that's going to, you know, be important for your vision necessarily. Um, and in answer to Debbie, yeah, it's the same thing about screen time. People are always looking for, parents are always looking for excuses <laughs> to stop screen time. And I published a study a while ago on smartphones and some benign kind of uh, uh, feeling of reduced vision people get, but it doesn't cause any problems. And, uh, and, and it, it made the media and my wife got phoned up by one of her friends saying, uh, you know, how your, your, your husband's study showed that uh, tablets and screen time causes cancer. Can you, can you tell me more about it? And so people kind of make what they want of it. But um, we don't know of any problems with screen time, but we, we do see sort of dry eyes uh, and, and sometimes that can exacerbate a bit. I guess when you're on a screen, like even when you're reading, uh, maybe also on a screen, you blink a bit less. So it can exacerbate dry eyes. And, and the recurrent corneal erosions are really common in the general population. So for quite a while, I wondered whether maybe it's just common in general population and it's not particularly commoner in Olport syndrome. And I've seen about 40 patients now with Olport syndrome. And, and, and I get the feeling it is a bit more common. And especially there are two um, boys in their late teens who I remember who had a much more severe version than I'd seen before. And then I arranged them to be seen by one of our corneal specialists, our leading corneal specialists at Moorfields for further treatment. And that was more than I'd seen in uh, in, in you know non Olport syndrome, so so pops it, it, is, it is a bit more common, but I agree the other thing's quite rare. Uh, and then uh, sorry to keep talking, but the, the other thing about the, the macular holes, um, a, a true macular hole will affect your vision. But a lot of the things that people see on OCTs that they call macular holes aren't really holes; they're a bit of thinning, or we might even call it a lamella hole. And and often it doesn't affect the vision so much. So just because it looks a bit abnormal on that OCT scan isn't anything to necessary to worry about until it's affecting the vision. Uh, that's great. Um, uh, so I'll just try and uh, get one of the uh, questions that, so there's a question uh, from Richard Naylor, is it the decimase membrane that is changed in the cornea? If so, would rubbing the eye promote corneal issues in patients with Alport syndrome? As such, would there be a requirement for patients with Alport syndrome to be checked for dry eye conditions? Any comments, Judy or Deb? Um, I don't think I'm the person who can answer that. Okay. De Deb, anything? Or, or I can... Decimase is one of the membranes that's affected. Yeah. So, so decimase is, 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 sorry, Deb, go on. It, it, decimase is type 4 collagen, so it definitely can be affected. And the usual abnormality is that rare condition that you mentioned, Judy, that we, I haven't seen, but we do know that it, it, it's... Uh, it is uh, some people in Europe do have this. So posterior there. polymorphous corneal dystrophy. Yeah. 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 Just, and I don't know of any any problem with eye rubbing that might pr promote corneal issues. I think in, if anything, it would be mild uh, corneal erosions that might cause you to rub your eyes. But I don't think it would be the rubbing that would cause the problem. Yeah, I agree. And and so the core is that see-through at the front of the eye and it's got lots of layers. It's really thin, but as ophthalmologists, we like splitting everything into lots of layers. And so the back layers decimates. And as you say, that's affected in this rare posterior polymorphous dystrophy that can happen without old ports as well. That's very rare. But the front layer, the epithelium, is what's affected in the recurrent erosions. And if someone's prone to that, we sometimes advise them, don't rub your eyes too much because... No one should rub their eyes too much, but we don't exactly as you say. Don't know of any particular link um, between that. Um, and another uh, question: um, Can you speak to whether or not these conditions have been found to be linked to Olport syndrome, specifically non-lattice retinal degeneration, keratoconus, and cataracts? Yeah. So can I speak to the non-lattice issue? Because I think. I think I answered a question from, was it Joy about this? And I think what's it's happened joy. there is Joy, yes. The patient has got, has been found by an ophthalmologist to have some abnormalities in the retina, but actually it's Al, the Alport pictures that Judy showed, I would predict. So if that person took the pictures that Judy has along to their ophthalmologist and says, is this what they've got, this what I've got, I predict that the ophthalmologist would say yes, but I called it by another name. So I think it fits, it, the, the, this language 
is what some ophthalmologists might use for the appearance that we're calling Alport retinopathy. Would you agree with that, Omar? Yeah, I think that's right. And, and non-lattice is a sort of funny word because there are lots of different types of degeneration. They may not even be different, just changes in the periphery. But because we as ophthalmologists get uh, kind of riled up about lattice because that can predispose to little holes in the retina, everything else we call non-lattice. So exactly as you say, that non-lattice might be an old thing. It could be something else. And, and um, as you say, we'd have to have a look and, and then see if it fitted into the, the old port category. Yeah be important for the genetics in the family so I'd be suggesting to get photos even though yeah. it seems unusual to ask the ophthalmologist to take some photos and then that person can share them in the Alport community and someone can match them up with the pictures. Yeah uh, and then the other two things were keratoconus um, so I don't know if you'd agree Deb that um, uh, so, so the lenticonus of course is associated but not keratoconus as far as I know, um, some, a patient did send me some very old literature that suggested it was, but I don't think that's what we currently think. I, I don't know what you think, Debbie. There's occasional case reports of keratoconus, but I think it's, um, I think it's just a mistake, probably. Yeah, uh, and, or somebody coincidentally has keratoconus. Yeah, Yeah, because they're allowed to, I guess, get other things, and I think it could be that. And we, we've done sort of corneal scans, pentacam uh, scans, looking, it's a sensitive indicator for keratoconus, and we haven't found it in, in the Fiolport patients we've looked mm -hmm. at. Um, and then the third thing was cataract. Um, I think you've answered that. So the, the cataract after transplant it would be more common because steroids predispose to cataract, but we've got a very effective operation for that. Um, and then the lens changes, we treat with the same operation, even though they're not cataract, it's just a different shape of the lens, but the same operation can be quite effective and really transformative for people's vision. Um, great. So and you can get a cataract, as I mentioned, you can get a cataract with the lenticonus. Right. Uh, and then um, next question, have any case studies been conducted using ocriplasmin in vitrectomy for macular holes surgically? What updates are there on the potential for this application? Any changes in potential procedures to stabilize and close macular holes in fragile Alport syndrome eyes? That any might comment? be a question for you, Omar. Okay, I, yeah. think, I think somebody asked us that a few years ago and we did ask um, an ophthalmologist who, and I think he said it hadn't been used or there was very little information about it, but, but uh, you know, what's your update on that? Yeah, I, th I think that's right. So uh, w macular holes are treated uh, uh, in patients with, with a vitrectomy um, and, um, uh, and that's in Allport patients and non Allport patients. It's true that the Allport patients' membranes may behave differently, but we don't know enough as to know whether that should make us change the, the procedure used. Um, probably still have to be the same operation, just like with the cataracts and the lenticonus. So not sure. Ocriplasmin was this injection that seems to dissolve the jelly of the eye um, and, and in some play, uh, cases might avoid you having to have the operation, the vitrectomy operation where you're taking the jelly out. Um, and there was a vogue for that a while ago. And then there were some reports of, of damage to layers of the retina, the photoreceptors, the cells that detect light in the retina with this ocroplasmin. So some patients had that, not the majority, but some of them did. Uh, so then many centers stopped using that. So our centers have stopped using ocroplasmin and, and um, I mean, it'd be great if one could avoid an operation, but, but it, doesn't, it seems to have some, some side effects that we didn't know about before that we're now quite worried about. Uh, so a uh, question from Rachel. Uh, hi Judy, do the flex on the retina correspond to the regions of thinning and is there a loss of cells and basement membrane thinning in these regions? Yes, there, so um, the, the flex are more widely distributed than the thinning. I mean, the way we're looking at the thinning is quite crude really, just saying is there um, a reduction compared with um, the other side of the eye? Uh, so it's not very specific, uh, it's not very sensitive, but um, it does correspond to some atrophy, yes. And we see that on the OCT. And I did show, I think, a, a picture before showing some abnormalities there, yeah. And that top line of the OCT, we call it the inner limiting membrane, that seems to be really bright in these patients and that seems to be where the, the flecks are. Uh, and, and interestingly, now we know that the cells, so this COL4A5 that you talked about and the collagen chains, we now know which cells 
uh, make in the retina and it seems to be these cells called Muller cells that hold everything together and make that membrane so it kind of all fits together now as, as we're understanding more about yes. it. So there's two membranes in the retina that have uh, type 4 collagen in them. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. Uh, and then uh, this is Francis, okay, to me, has Omar ever seen lenticonus in a female with X-linked Olport syndrome? Um, the answer is not convincingly. Uh, we've had a few where we feel that the vision's a bit worse than, than the amount of cataracts suggests. And we know that some people can get something called subclinical lenticonus. So lenticonus when the lens has that dimple that Judy showed. But there are lots of people where we can't see the dimple, but when we do some very clever tests looking at the the, the front of the, the lens, we find that, that it is there. So we've wondered, uh, so I can't say convincingly we've seen it yet in an X-linked female, but uh, there are a few we've wondered about. Um, Deb, Deb might have more on that. Have you ever yeah. seen it in a female? The I, lens? Haven't, I haven't seen it, but, uh, and we don't have easy access to the ultrasound. Is that what you're referring to? to the yeah, we, we tried with the Pentacam and also there's this, um, uh, these wavelength aberometers, these, these uh, yeah. things that refractive surgeons like to, that can tell us how good the lens is as at transmitting the light. And, and we saw some abnormalities, but you know, it's, it's hard to be sure. If we see a woman with lenticonus, we think it's recessive Olport syndrome. Right. I've definitely right. seen it in recessive in women when it's recessive. Yeah. Right. That's so, helpful. yeah, we say look at your genetics, query your genetics. Yeah. Uh, so this one uh, is about non-lattice degenerate. We've answered that. Let's go to uh, Manish from India. I was diagnosed with FSGS, which is focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, is that right, Judy? Uh, by kidney biopsy and a variant of Olport, X-link dominant by genetic testing. Testing showed that it's slightly pathogenic with an unusual variant mutation that is and what is observed in normal. Uh, I've been, along with kidney issues, I've been suffering, suffering from the last five to six years, but no hearing, with no hearing loss. Have such unusual mutations been noted? And how do you correlate these reports with our, my clinical status? Kindly comment. I guess we can't always comment exactly on your case without knowing all the information, which we wouldn't want you to put on, on this, but, um, but maybe some general comments, Judy, on, on that. Um, I'd just be wondering what your renal function is like. What I will say is that people with FSGS now we know commonly have an Allport gene mutation. Uh, when I say commonly, uh, it's depending on the age group, it, it could be up to 20%. So um, maybe not quite that high. Uh, when we have looked in a cohort with FSGS, and we've looked at about 50 of them, uh, we thought maybe if we see the Allport retinopathy, we'll be able to diagnose Allport syndrome. Um, and it will tell us who to do genetics on. And we actually could not find the Allport retinopathy. And that may be because we'd already screened them, and, but uh, there was kind of no undiagnosed uh, Allport syndrome there. So I think there's certainly a milder kind of Allport syndrome uh, that doesn't necessarily have the hearing loss or it comes occurs later and the, um, doesn't necessarily get the lenticonus and might get late onset renal failure. And maybe some of those FSGSs have that uh, abnormality, have a, a less severe mutation. And, and maybe that's what uh, Manush is talking about. Thanks. Um, another question, is there a link with Olport's and optic nerve drusen? No, I, I, yeah. Inherited. I would say no. I, I've not seen anyone with both. No, nor have I. And, and, and optic nerve drusen can be relatively common, so it, it could be just someone with Olport's who has both, I guess. Uh, and then there's a question, but, could there but, be... But the word Sorry. drusen is pointing out OMA though. So yeah. we use drusen for white dots. So if somebody's heard their ophthalmologist use drusen as a word, they need to ask whether it's optic nerve head drusen or drusen elsewhere, because we use the same word for some Alport uh, features. We That's use right, the word yeah. drusen. I just want to note we're close to wrapping it up. So if we can have one more question, I'm sorry oh, we're not okay. going to be able to get to everyone. Have you got a favourite there, Patrick? Uh, let's see. Uh, I like the Rachel Lennon question. Okay. 
I'll leave it to you. <laughs> okay. Do the mouse models with Alport syndrome develop the eye features? Ah, good question. Not looked at many mouse eyes. They usually haven't been looked at. So I think it's harder to um, work out uh, if uh, they have eye abnormalities because they, they usually haven't been examined. So, um, uh, you know, what would you do? Would you do ophthalmoscopy? Heart? Yes. And yeah. you could do, you could do um, histology. That would be quite interesting. Um, we have done, uh, we've studied a dog model of Allport syndrome and we did see uh, a retinopathy and we also saw lenticonus. That's fascinating. And, and you can do OCTs of, of mouse eyes uh, in specialist okay. doctors. So that'd be interesting. I guess a lot of the stuff we see in the macula and mouse don't, mice don't nor have a normal macula, so maybe we won't see it. But like you say, the dogs might be more revealing in, in that uh, in that way. But yeah, lots more for us to do. Yes. Good. Great. Very Thank you very much both. I really appreciate a very thorough um, examination of so many questions. I think it would be lovely if we can to end with a word cloud. Um, there will be a link posted in chat now um, by one of our uh, producers. If you just click on that, um, everyone that's watching, and type in a word um, that kind of encapsulates how you feel about having watched the workshop today, we will have one of our producers sharing their screen as well so we can see the words as they pop up. Enlightening, whoever got in first, excellent work. Quick on the draw. Very informative, connected, educated, fascinating. Yeah, sure, lots of new ground today. I love this, watching, uh, watching uh, positivity build up before your very eyes. <clears throat> Mouse work needed. <laughs> uh, yes, um, uh, we've, we've interviewed a lot of researchers over the last uh, what is it, nine or so weeks. And we haven't seen someone working on uh, eye abnormalities in mouse models. So uh, we'll be excited to see that if it, if it comes up. Uh, okay, I think that just about wrapped it up for our feedback portion. Um, thanks everyone for, for submitting to the word cloud and thanks for coming today. I really enjoyed um, our first proper workshop on eyes um, and it's really exciting to be finally addressing it as an issue. Thank you to Judy and Deb, of course, for sharing their fascinating research with us. Uh, it's a real privilege to have this relationship with cutting edge scientists. Thank you, of course, to Omar as well for helping me moderate. Uh, a massive thank you to Kidney Research UK. Uh, your contributions help keep these workshops running and we're very thankful for your support. Before we go, some information on our next workshop. That is going to be in two weeks on the 22nd of July. Um, we will have a webinar back at the normal time of 5.30 p.m. BST, which will allow me to have a bit of a lion. Oh, God, I said that out loud, didn't I? Anyway, new treatment and clinical trials with our presenters, uh, Michelle Rowe and Rachel Lennon. That's going to be extremely exciting. We're going to learn about all the new drugs um, that are being developed for treating Allport syndrome. If you have any feedback about the session or want to uh, be signed up to our mailing list, you can email us. Uh, that's at research at allport.info. Uh, and likewise, if you have any specific clinical concerns that we didn't address today, uh, feel free to email that email uh, as well um, and get your query answered a bit more privately. Please hit us up on social media to hear about updates on our workshops as they happen uh, and details about upcoming research and physical workshops, God forbid. Patients can join the Allports Warriors Facebook group uh, and anyone can hit us up on our Twitter page at Allport UK. For those of you uh, that would like a recording of this talk, as Judy mentioned, we're going to have it up uh, over the next week, hopefully, uh, on our YouTube and Facebook pages. Otherwise, have a great